Good evening. Good evening to us. How are we doing? Everybody looking pretty good? Pretty good. All what right. Buffalo you had. Huh? What that buffalo fish you had. Well, you see that. Damn, I'm on the internet trying to tease people. <laughs> well, I I purchased him, but he, he didn't get he didn't get some he didn't get in some grease already. <laughs> he got in some grease. Look, um, I'm thankful to the Lord for us and them. If you didn't get it, I was out in that crowd today, and I got my second COVID shot, so I'm in pretty good shape, I hope. Uh, what about you, Stan? You got in yet? I get my second one on the 11th. I got my first one um, three weeks ago. Oh, well, then, Chuck, me and you running pretty good then. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, I get mine on the 17th. You you got you you gonna get your second one on seventeen? Yes. All right. Well, that's what. Uh, uh, would be you get yours yet? I can't hear you. You're muted. I still can't hear you, but uh, you're all right. You're all right. I'm I'm trying to get you to hear. Oh, all right, stand up. Now I can hear you. What yeah. about you, Dr. Master Gardner? You young enough to get yours yet? <laughs> All right, Stanley, give us another selection, and then Demp, you start preparing yourselves to give us a scripture reading. And by that time, I would choose someone to give us a prayer, and we shall move on. And all of the people of God say they man. Yeah. Uh, Sister Maxie Gardner, uh, after Demp would give us a scripture reading, I want to ask you to uh, ask God's blessings upon us. And as we pray, let us remember uh, Mady J and Miranda talked to Sister uh, uh, Annette. She was telling about Shelby had a kind of had a scare, sugar to drop, but he's doing all right now. So I'm still asking us to pray one for another and believing that the prayers of the righteous persons avail as much. Then would you give us a scripture at this time? Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter began the third first verse. But as for thee, saying that here by me. I will speak unto thee all the commandments and the statutes and the judgment, which I shall teach them that they may do them in the land which I give them to possess it. You shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God had commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the way which the Lord your God had commanded you that you may live and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. I read Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter, from the third first verse to the end in its entirety. That the Lord has special to the real, real words. Thank you. Thank you. Sister Gardner, would you lead us in a word of prayer, please? Our Father and our God, our Savior, our Redeemer, our deliverer, our healer, our all in all. Lord, we come today asking you to forgive us for our sins that you may hear and answer our prayers. We ask you to let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in that sight today, Father God. We come thanking you for this opportunity to just come before your presence, Father God, this evening. We thank you for giving us the breath, the breathe, the, the, the movement of our bodies, Father God, for our mind to think, Lord. It's so many people who have been cut off from this, Father God. It's so many people who are just laying in the hearts filled from the COVID. It's so many people just going through life's trials and tribulations, Father God. And we thank you. And we know that we go through things and we don't be in this situation always, Father God. Our seasons come and our seasons go. 
And for that, we can say thank you, Father God, for not letting us be in that state always. But Father God, we come with grateful hearts today, thanking you for things with us as well as they is. And Father God, we come lifting up before you all our sick members and those whose names we cannot call. We ask you to remember Mady and Miranda. Remember Sister Sylvia, Father God. We ask you to remember Father God, Shelby and Annette, and, and all those who are sick among us whose names I do not know or I cannot call. But it's one good thing about you, Father God. You know everything there is to know about everybody. And Father God, for that, we can say thank you. You know our deepest secrets, Father God. You know the numbers of hairs on our head. Father God, you take us and you wrap us in our arms when the storm, in your arms when the storm comes against us and say, just hold on to me, my child. Everything's going to be all right. We lift our pastor up to you today, Reverend Stanley, for his dedication to us being able to meet again. We lift Thank our entire inspiration of the church up to you, Father God. Everybody is either in a storm, just came out of a storm, or going Thank through a storm. You. But Thank one you. thing about the storm, Father God, you are the anchor that holds us, Father God. If we can just tie a knot in a rope and just hold on to your word, hold on to your spirit, and it will lead us and guide us from one thing to the next. And Lord, we praise you today. We thank you today, Father God, for every church door that stands open in your name. And all those who are on the line, they might be going through something that we don't even God know about, mercy. Father God. And we thank you. We thank you, Lord. And we praise your most holy name. I heard hallelujah is the highest praise. And hallelujah to your name today. Father God, continue to look down upon this earth, look down upon our politicians and the people who are going through this COVID, Father God. Let the vaccine work that we may be healed, Father God. We thank you already for the scientists who had the knowledge that you gave them to come up with the vaccine. Father God, we How lift ourselves, we lift this world, and we lift everybody up to you, Father God. We just thank you for Jesus, for sitting him to die on the cross, that we could have this right. And Lord, we thank you once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And all of the people of God say amen. amen. Thank you, Sister Gardner, for such a fervent prayer. Stanley, give us a selection, and then we're going to be right back with our lesson for today. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, let's get excited in the house of God today. Oh, come on.
All the time. All the people of God say that man. Mr. Brooks, I was watching you, baby. You look like you need to get back to the choir. You know all the words on the song. That's <laughs> thank you, thank you. Today's lesson um, is one of those lessons that many of us have read, and um, hopefully that we've come to the right conclusion of it. Nevertheless, our lesson for the day kind of begins in an unusual spot. Starts almost in the middle. I said in the middle to give us a letter, the latter portion of our lesson for today. Uh, and in order to kind of understand today's lesson, you really need to back up and read the first portion of it so you can understand because if it just start off at mm -hmm. verse 25 <clears throat> you're going to miss what the author is saying to us so you really need to go back to verse if you went back no further than verse 4 you would see that there was an, an urgency a criteria uh jesus on the move and he said, "It need be that I need to go to Samaria. I'm going to deal with that just a little bit later on. But Samaria, the Samaritan people were kind of, if you would, uh, cross mixed people with uh, other people after the Assyrians had uh, invaded them. They left a few folk there from this particular group, um, the um, uh, Samaritan people. Our overall topic deal with the idea called to testify who you and I are called to testify both of the goodness and of the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ of all the things that he has done for us for all that he is doing he is doing for us and we need to give God the praise all of the time to testify you used to have a song that we sang not this new stuff to have that. You used to have something, I believe I'll testify about what the Lord has done for me. And now when I say what the Lord has done for me, I'm not bothering you. I said what he has done for me. <laughs> so now if he hasn't done anything for you, I, I, I don't have nothing to do with that. Well, I'm talking about what he has done for me. He's been good to me. I said this and I really don't want to sound as if I'm being facetious when I say it, but uh, some of you perhaps will not live to be uh, double H. But thank the Lord he allowed me to see double H. And I'm still in, I think, pretty good shape. Uh, you know, I have some, and that ain't without some aches and pain, which shook him. I'm glad to be around here with the aches and pains and, and to see you. Let me just begin reading at verses 25, and I'm going to ask us now. You're going to have to go back <laughs> to uh, verse 1 to come up to here, because otherwise you're going to miss what the author is trying to say or call uh, to testify. Verse 25, the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah has come, which is called Christ. When he has come, he would tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto, unto thee am he. And upon this came the disciples and marveled that he talked with woman, yet no man said, What seeketh thou white told of it? And what I'm trying to say is this since it's the Samaritan and the Jews that have no dealing with them, that's gonna be back in in, in, in other part of the lesson. And then to see Jesus talking to this Samaritan woman, uh, uh, she had already said, you know, and he, he had told us some stuff about himself. And I think he need to tell you this, nothing escaped, escaped the old CNI of God. God see you. Not some of the time, but all of the time. And then the next scary part about that is God knows our hearts afar off 
He the most scary. And he <laughs> all of our ways. So he sees this woman. And when they come up on him, his he's a, and you got to go back to reading that, but his disciples that came with him, when he came in to enter the edge of Sarkar there, he sits on Jacob's well, and they go on into town to get some, some groceries to eat on. And when they come back, they find he's told this woman. And he had, he had scouted this woman. You got to read back to what happened to say that she, she left her water pots and went away into the city and said to the men, come see a man which has told me all the things I did is not this the Christ. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed, said, Master, eat, they're going to get him some food. But he has something that's more important uh, than food. Some of us, some of us, some of us, food is the main criteria in our life, but you got to some sometimes eat to live instead of living to eat. We eat to live and get to uh, do that. Um, but he said unto them, I have meat to, or I have food to eat that you know not all. Therefore said the disciple one to another, has any man brought him all or something to eat? Jesus said unto them, my meat or my food, my will, my desire is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus came to finish what the Lord has said do that deed. And he finished that you by the time you can see that in John 18, 37, where he says, Well, this cause came out to the world and on for this end of love born. He came into the world to do what he was doing. Say not to you. And this is this is country talk. Say not to you. They are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the field, for they are white already to harvest. He's not talking about the field of the field. He's talking about people. You meet people every day that need to be talked to, need to be told about the goodness of the Lord. And at the end, I'm going to do with some men. I'm just wondering how many have you talked to. And herein, it is said, true, one soweth, another reapers. I sent you to reap. And whereupon you restored no labor. Other men labor, and you enter into their labor. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, who is testify, he told me everything I did. So when the Samaritan were coming to him, they resold him that he would stay a tarry with them, and he abode there two more days. And many more believed because of his word and said unto the woman, now we believe not because of your saying, but we've heard ourselves and know that this indeed is the Christ. And this all kind of began this lesson off and I was trying to do that to get us to understand where I am. He says this, and to grasp the truth of this, this story fully, you kind of need to step into that particular world in which they live. Can't understand what he's saying to them. When King Solomon died, oh yes, Solomon. Who was Solomon? Solomon was the third king of Israel. Saul being the first pope. Got tired of theocratic uh, rule, and they wanted a king. But God had told them what was going to happen. And uh, Saul um, was like another fellow. He got the big head. <laughs> he got the big head, and he wanted to do a lot of stuff. Sometimes you put folk in 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 in, in, in high position. You can find out what they made out of it. He got to be here. And he got such a big head, they did like another fellow. 
he wanted to take the preacher's place. <laughs> and uh, there's some folk now who think that they, you know, ought to be some place or not, but you, you just stay in your place. <laughs> you stay in your place. Everything is going to be all right. So uh, when Solomon died, Saul being the first king, David, when he dies, uh, he transfers over to the hands of his son Solomon, who makes the kingdom greater. And then when Solomon dies, the nations are split now. Ten tribes go to the north, which is called Israel. Two tribes go to the south, which is called Judah. That's where we are today. And during that period of time, they had some wicked king. One of them by the name of Ring King Oram. Um, he was the one who built the city of Samaria. And then we had another one by the name of Ahab. Ahab had a tough sugar named Jezebel. She was a tough sugar, but uh, and then he ruled uh, from in Samaria as an infamous, established in the city and the last of his sight. Uh, ignoring, ignoring, uh, an ignoring warning of the prophet led to judgment. The ultimate form of the judgment came when the Assyrians uh, destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC. And I've said this over and over to us, and look like y'all kind of what I'm saying. One fell in 722 BC by the Assyrian. The other one lasted 100 plus years later in 586 BC. Judah fell. And, uh, and from that, when Judah fell, then it's where the Samaritans get mixed up in them by they taking the best people and leaving them. They was in the bread and the Samaritans, uh, when Judah finally came comes back home uh, in 400 plus, the Samaritans wanted to help them build a city, but they wouldn't allow them to help them build a city. So that kind of uh, infuriated them even more than the book of Nehemiah. You see where when San Ballard and others wanted to help in building the city and uh, Nehemiah refused. And then they tried to pay a strategy, a strategy to get them down. So, but he tell them we're on the wall and we're doing a good work and we can't come down. Our lesson begins after Jesus and a Samaritan woman discussed her marriage situation. That's gonna be back in chapter four, verses 16 um, through 18. He says to us, where is your husband? She says, uh, I really don't have one. He says, you finally told the truth. You really have had five. And the one that you're living with now is not your husband. This is where our lesson picks up when he says, when, when, the, when, when the cyber come up there where they were, she drops a water pot and she goes into town to tell the story. Verses 25. The woman said unto him, dear Messiah, here uh, the Jews believed he would be a national leader who would free them from the foreign oppression. You see that in Acts 1, 6 and 7. After he had died, Jesus, the apostle said to him, Lord, what do I at this time restore unto us the kingdom of Israel? Jesus said, that's not, for your, that's not your business when I'm going to do that, but you shall receive power. And the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And I'm wondering how well are we witnessing, and how well are we testifying about the goodness of the Lord? Or uh, this one more know when Messiah comes. Jesus says to the verse 26, I let speak it unto you. I mean, Jesus did not seek to set the woman straight regarding whether the Jews or the Samaritans understood, understand that Christ was correct. Instead of laying out scripture regarding himself, he would do that later on after the resurrection. Turn right quickly to Luke chapter 24. I'm going to try to do this 24. And he says something here, Luke chapter 24. This is after he had been crucified, he had been resurrected, 
uh, from the dead. 24. Verses 25. Let me just, let me just, let me just go back one, one more point here. 25. 24, 25. Remember, he had led that crowd with the, they had, he had gone into Sarkar with the other folks. 25. Then said he, he met this crowd, he woke with, he had met these folks on the way to Amantis. He talks to them. He acts as though he's going to go on by. They constrain him, which is, I'm going to use that terminology. He ate with them. He broke bread with them. When he broke bread with them, they recognized who he was. So he said to them, Oh, ye are foolish and hard, slow to believe all that the prophet had given. Oh, my Christ have to suffer these things and to enter into his glory. And beginning with Moses, he expound all of the things that he left they needed to know about them. And they understood. Then, when they understood, they went back to town to tell the story about the goodness of the Lord. And upon his and upon this come the disciples. And you can see back in the back in the book there. This, so this uh, Samaritan woman had told Jesus when he asked her for some water. You being a Jew and I'm a Samaritan, you had the nerve to ask me for some water. Uh Jesus said had already said to her, if you really knew who it was that asked you for water. You would have gladly done so, but I could give you water that be wells of water that springeth up into everlasting life. So she wanted to know from Jesus, well, what, what you gonna draw with? Our, our father, uh, Jacob, built this with a long time ago, and it's deep, and you ain't got nothing to draw with. He said, well, I can give you some water that you won't be thirsty no more. She said, give me some of this water. And he really wasn't talking about water, water. He was talking about the spiritual gift that the Lord would have to take. And when they and when they when they come back, when they when it returned back, when the disciples returned back to him with food, the author perhaps was John with one of those men who were there, and they marveled, but were not bold enough to ask what or why. Sometimes we do that sometimes. Pastor, prophet, won't you? You won't, you won't just come up and say it, but you try to go around and around about way to get to where you're trying to go. They uh, they wanted to ask the Lord the question, but they were a little bit shy of doing it. The woman, I found out something. When you ever get some Jesus in you, you get excited. Amen. In a better moment, when you first met the Lord and come alive, you was excited. You Want to tell everything. I was when I was reading this lesson today. I thought about me and uh, my wife got married on a Saturday evening stand, and she had a good friend from Detroit to come over. I'm a young deacon in New York Calvary Baptist Church, and she wanted to go to the Black and Tan. They didn't have no service at the Black and Tan. <laughs> <laughs> they were smoking cigarettes, drinking whatever they're drinking. I am so miserable. I don't know what to do. And there comes a point that you need to come out of that crowd. I said to her, now look up, baby. I won't be going back to the black and tan no more. I've been there, I've done that. I ain't going back there more. And I just feel so uneasy. It was some years later. A club called 500 in, in Detroit. She used to ask me to quit the car. Go ahead on. And she said she went on it one day. See, the CBB BB was BB was her boy. Oh, she was crazy about BB King. And she said, while well, she's sitting there, house was filled with smoke. Yo, you know, there have been so many places that the place is filled with smoke. You can smell cigar, big red, there, red. And she said she sat there and looked. And, he said, what in the world am I doing here? <laughs> and that ended up that, but she had to come to that conclusion for herself, by herself. Sometimes 
when you really meet Jesus, your total, not only will the altitude change, but your attitude uh, will change when you meet the Lord. Uh, and she left her water pots, went into town. This, this, the officer said they want to bend in her pots. And uh, when she came, when she got into town, she said to the men, 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 I remember now what this kind of woman this was. This woman was, uh, had done had five husbands and living with one, five sad, five, and living with one. But once she met the Lord, I'm saying, I'm, what I'm saying is this here, the Lord can save us from anything. He won't save you in it. He will save you from it. I'm saying this sister had a lot of sisters in Samaria that really didn't like her because she might, I don't know who she's going with, but she had another man. The Lord said, you done had five husbands and one you got now. Uh, not sure. But she went in town and it's strange when she, she goes into town and tell the women, come see a man which has told me all the things I did is not Mr. Christ. All the things. This woman had kind of two parts on this woman. At first, she gave evidence that Jesus was something more than an ordinary man. Second, she proposed the form of question, a tentative conclusion, the evidence, and wondered whether or not Jesus might be the Christ. The woman challenged Jesus to be the Christ, and he said to her, I am, and then she brought him one other folk to go to investigate to see whether or not he was who he said he was. Verse 30. They went out of the city, and that is the city of Samaria, and they came unto him. The woman's testimony intrigued the people enough that they don't want to investigate the claim. I got a funny feeling somebody might be listening to me. Folk knew who you were before you accepted Christ. And once he came into your life, they heard your story and they just wanted to come to see what was going on in your life. What was going on? I told you this before about this boy that I worked with. He wanted to know what did I do for fun. I said, man, I go to church. You go to church? I said, yes, sir. I, I got the pop. I said, well, I am Papa. When I go to church, I, man, I'm in good shape there. I'm miserable when I don't go to church. Oh, yes, speaking of that, maybe that's why some of us are, hold on, hold on, hold on. I know we've been out of, well, we have many in the building now for 30, uh, for, almost, for almost a year. But that's in the building. But I try to have church every Tuesday and every Sunday morning. Come to get us together that we can get fed, that we can get to understand what's going on. But in order to do so, you're going to have to try to help me a little bit. And uh, the woman testimony, the woman testimony intrigued them enough. Uh, and they wanted to find out for sure who he really was. In the meanwhile, remember back in the early beginning of the chapter though, Jesus meets this woman in, in, in uh, Zachard, the boys go, to get some food. And by this time, then when they come back, the meanwhile, when they come back, uh, his disciples prayed him saying, Master, uh, we know you're hungry and need to eat. The disciples were either mentally dismissed or think about how important this woman's story must have been to them. Perhaps they themselves were hungry. And because they themselves was hungry, they didn't want to eat without Jesus. But Jesus had them understand that uh, preaching the gospel of being people is more than about eating, more than about eating. I was talking to one about 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 uh, fasting and praying. They said, "No, I can't. I can't do no fast and praying. I got to eat." <laughs> when when I, if you can't afford to miss one or two meals, something wrong with you. So when eating becomes them, your number one priority. The word media, 
We have food to food in general. He offered the woman living water back in John 14. He also foreshadowed Jesus' self-description as the bread of life. In John, John chapter 6, he said, I am the bread. He that eateth of me shall never hunger. Therefore, said the disciple one to another, if somebody had brought him something to eat. The confused disciples did not detect his reference to spiritual rather than physical food. And once again, they did not ask Jesus the question that was on their mind. Instead, they spoke one to another. Sometimes you need to talk to the person rather than talking to somebody else. They can't understand everything. You need to talk to the person themselves. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't do that. The book of John is that Jesus had been sent from the Father to finish a task that he began in John chapter 5. As a hero of this word, work was being, was bringing the people to faith, that's in 629, knowing that the disciples confused, and Jesus began to explain his meat was spiritually in nature, doing the work of him that sent him in John 5, 19, was the great subsistence of the soul. While the disciples had been away in pursuit of food, in 4, 8, he had talked to the woman. Jesus had been busy ministering to an open wine, open minded woman, doing so what was energizing him. And when you when you get wrapped up into the word of God, the more that you tell people about the Lord, the more the Holy Spirit will give you to be able to say. And then Jesus uses, if you would, a Farmer scenario. There are yet four months and then come to the house. What he's saying is, you don't plant food today and be able to well, put it either come, either come. You don't plant greens today and go out and pick some. It's going to take you to have time for them to come up and get long enough to do that. But the crop is always ready to harvest for people in the world. Every day, you and I live, we and move, move around, you come into contact with somebody who need to know the Lord in the part of our sin. Of which stands over and over, over again, he run up on people day, on a daily basis who need to know the Lord. So you need to tell them about uh, what the Lord is, is, is saying, and I have said to them, uh, the harvest is playing. Matthew, Matthew, Galatians, chapter 6, verses 6, 7, and 8 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, and he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting. So, other words, Leo Daniel said a long time ago in one of his sermons, it's coming up again. The witch you plant is coming up again. You might not believe, but it's going to be back to the hunt you all be back to come back to make you make you happy. Behold, Jesus said, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the field, for they are white and ready to harvest. This thing about being a missionary mandate is important. Everywhere we go, we run into people that we need to try to harvest for the Lord. The field Jesus wanted the disciples to understand were not plots of wheat or barley, but people. Most of the folk Many times that we, that we meet every day, a lot of folk do not know Christ. And since you know him, you need to kind of do like old sister Emma Bright used to do. Folk come to church, come to Bright, on New Orleans to Church. Emma Bright had a way of going to be easing up on the side of him. And if you didn't watch yourself, Emma would be there, testify to him and have them know if they were, if they were not in somebody's church, 
She was trying to help him. Man, why don't you come out? He's trying to help to get people saved. The fields of white mean the, the heads of the grain have turned from green to light brown color. This indicates the sign that was full of material. When it comes to sharing the gospel, there is no time to waste. As on the auspicious day in the Samaritans, too far, the, the field was too far to right. Some of the disciples had been told previously that when Jesus first called them, Peter, Peter, James, and John, he said to them, drop your nets, and I'm going to make you become fishers of men. Catching fish is one thing, and catching people is another. And you got to use the right bait. Amen. And I don't need you going out there, going to try to catch a bunch of brim with a big old hunk of meat on your hook. You ain't going to catch it. You catch a catfish or some other big fish, but you ain't going to catch no brim with them. You need a small hook with, some, with either a cricket or a woman. Don't do like what be did. I've taken her. And she throwed all trying to throw my face away. She said they were tired of catching. <laughs> but you know, people have to be to, to do that. And <clears throat> verse 36. And he that reapeth receives wages and gathers fruit into life eternity. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice. In evangelism. As in farming, there is a sowing and a reaping time. The gospel must be shared, sowed, for faith to bear fruit. Be ready. The results is a crop of believers. The goal is not to fully gone, but to have a full heaven, full of, not church folk, but full of saved folk. There is a difference between church people and saved people. Saved people are those who have eternal life. That's really what Jesus asked Nicodemus. When you were saved again, you are safe, eat, and that's what it's really part of our uh, Baptist doctrine we believe in. Uh, once you are saved, you are saved. But the question is, are you saved? You're saved. And verse 37. And herein is that saying true. One soweth, another reapeth. I might, you might not come at that point. Well, when I sow the seed, I might not be the one to that will get you to come, but somebody else will know that. I sowed it, and then somebody else will come by and be able to reap the harvest of what I'm trying to say to them. Uh, two, verse 36, I'm trying to jump. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gather fruit unto life eternity, eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth shall rejoice together. That's going to be important, we rejoice together. Verse 37. And herein is that true saying, one soweth another reapeth. And we need to try to get that together. If no seeds are planted, nothing from nothing leave how much? I believe nothing from nothing gonna leave nothing. Though the disciples did not really adequate at that particular moment, to reap was swiftly approaching in John 4 39 through 42. That's gonna be on down further in our lesson. But he wanted us to understand that. He said in verse 38, I send. <clears throat> You to reap that whereon you bestow the labor, other men's labor, and you enter into the harvest. 
He's trying to get them to understand what he's talking about here. Verse 39. And many of the Samaritans in that city believed on Jesus because of the saying of the woman which testified he has told me everything I did. You can run, but you can't hide. The idea of testimony lead to faith and a certain pattern in the gospel. Jesus inspired words and miraculous works or testimony of themselves that he is the one sent by the Father, the Messiah, both of the Jews and Samaritan have been looking for. All of this is ultimately reflected in the book's purposes of John chapter 20, verses 31 and 32. John chapter 20. Verse 31 and 32. John chapter 20. Verse 31 and 32. John chapter 20. Over there. John chapter 20. Verse 31. Thirty thirty one, and thirty verse thirty, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but they were written that you might believe that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Very familiar description. Jesus came to the world for everybody. Everybody know John 3, 16, but some of us don't know verse 17. 16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have uh, eternal everlasting life. Verse 17 said, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 42. I'm jumping. And many more believe because of his word. A lot of the Samaritans back in verse 30 and 40, they believe because of the Samaritan woman, but many more believe because of Jesus' own word and said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of your saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this indeed is the Christ. Used to have an old friend named Tommy Don, used to sing the song, the day that I was converted, was the greatest experience that I've ever had. And I can't forget it. You might not, you might not remember the day precisely, but you know when something's strange, and that don't happen all the time. When you come up and get a preacher's hand, everybody woke up and get a preacher's hand and not say, it takes some time, some time for you to accept Christ as your personal savior. And when that happened, you'll have a new dawn in your life when it does happen. Uh, let me read one story and then I'm going to have to quit. The conclusion. The story of Jesus in kind of with the woman at the wells serves several purposes in the book of John. One, he teaches the spirit nature of the worship. And chapters 4 verses 23 to 24. 
it, and, and in chapter three, that you and especially verse twenty four, you you see what the Lord said: God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. I said that to say this: that a lot of folk go to church, but they don't worship. It's gonna have to come through spirit and and truth, and one day. If you keep on going, it'll happen to you. And you can say something got a hold of me. I went to the church one night, my heart wasn't right, but something got a hold on me. It portrays Jesus as a fearless moving beyond the boundaries of the Occidental Judaism to an awkward encounter with a Samaritan woman back in verse 9 of chapter 4, and it demonstrates the influence of a person of conviction and the urgency it can have when talking to another about Jesus. She told him, come see a man. She was both a part of the harvest and a farmer sowing. Her work was contributed to a faithful harvest indeed. Many who read the Gospel of John can identify with her, even though she was kind of an ostracized woman. She was a woman who came to, to get water at a time of day when she knew it wouldn't be there. And she did that for a purpose. She didn't want folk picking at her. She knew she had all of them husbands, et cetera. So everybody else got the water by that time. But Jesus, that's why Jesus said back in reading, it's need be that I must go through Samaria. He knew she's going to be there. And because he knew she's going to be there, this woman didn't know who, quite who it was going to be. Uh, only to encounter Jesus and to be transformed. The villagers objected to of, 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 of this particular, what was going on. It would be nice, this author said. It would be nice. If we could would have known this woman's name, nobody know her name. It makes us wonder about the women of faith whose names are lost in history. Many of them have spoken out to bring others to faith. Thank God for the women. Many taught thy sons and thy daughters to pray. Many read scriptures to their children to plant the seed of faith. Some even lived with unbelieving husbands. See that in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Woman be unbelieving husband, you act right, you can sometime, sometime you can convert some of these men who is good. Their names may be unknown to us, but they are not unknown to God. He has written thy name in the Lamb's book of life in Revelation 21. Someday in heaven, we may be able to look into the book and learn this Samaritan woman name, the name of one whose testimony changed the community forever. He asked the question, will your name be there? I'm asking a question. How many have you talked to about Jesus? How many do you think will be credited to you, how many would you be guilty for of telling them to come and see a man who have told me everything? It doesn't happen all the time where a man is able to convert his wife. Most of the time, it's you girls that got to try to get us. <laughs> Can I get a witness here? We had some mess on our mind. I was I I am blessed. 
That's what my wife tells me. She tell me that I was converted. She was converted under my preaching. I said, thank the Lord. I got some of you girls perhaps who are listening today who tried to convert your husbands. But in order to do that, you're going to have to walk the choke line and don't let them rub your face about it. I thought you were a Christian. Be a Christian and live a righteous life. Let uh, the influence, that you can influence them to come and see a man whose name is Jesus. I'm praying it's a possibility that there are a lot of women whose name we may never know, who have been instrumental in saving the lives of a lot of people. These, some of these women have become testimonies of the goodness of the Lord. I'm a living testimony. I should have been dead, but God let me live on. Anybody out there raise your hand today and say, I'm just a living testimony. And I want folk to know I live because he lives within me. God bless us. Heaven smile upon us and let us, even though we might be disliked by people, but let us do like this Samaritan woman. Once we meet Jesus, let us become witnesses to testify about the goodness of the Lord. Help me to do our mission I'm persuaded by the teaching of the Blessed Bible, by daily reading and meditation and communion with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to live an upright Christian life, to practice his teaching, my deal with my fellow man, to dedicate my talents, give my time, influence, and means to teach those friends the Christian religion at home and abroad, to win souls to personal service for Christ, to encourage and help in the enlistments of young people in Christian work and to make my home a center of Christian light and love. To these ends, I pledge to devote myself and seek divine aid and guidance daily, that I may become a living witness and a bright and shining light for my Lord. Some writer says, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer, and those that love the Lord said, amen, amen, amen. Read it again. Go back to verse 1. Try to get it to understand what it said. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to see us on another day. And uh, as let's continue to hold on. Hold on. Bless you. Stand. Um, Pastor. You could get a piece of that big catfish, that big uh, buffalo fish. Is, but I had some already. Pastor. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Pastor. Yes. Uh, I sent out a text to uh, our church family and, and to you as well, uh, just in case those that haven't gotten it, uh, Chance's mother passed on today. I was informed by Gay that Chance's mother passed, and that's the sister of Tanisha and Ashley. Say that again. Chance's Rutledge mother uh -huh. passed today. Okay. And I sent you a text and to the church family to be in prayer for okay. Tanisha and Ashley. And we also received a, a thank you for the acts of love from the New Inspiration Church to the O'Neill family. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, thank you, thank you, baby. Thank you so kindly. Let's don't forget now, I saw on that earlier, pray for Annette and Shelby. 
um, Miranda and her mother and others that have been going through this crisis in our lives, I still believe that prayers of the righteous persons availed much. Help me. Everybody say amen. 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 Thank you for being so kind in the past. We ask that you would please uh, send your gifts to the New Inspiration Church Post Office Box 3702. 71133 Shreveport, Louisiana. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Love y'all. Ain't nothing you can do about it.